Okay, thank you guys. I want to talk to you guys about my favorite subject tonight. So this is you. So fundamentally you're about three pounds and this is the physical incarnation of everything in your life. Your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations. It's all contained in this little three pound organ. Why do we think it's there? It's because if you were to lose part of your pinky, you would be sad about it, but you wouldn't be any different as a person. But if you lose an equivalently sized little chunk of brain tissue, that can change you entirely. It changes your personality, your ability to um, see color, your ability to understand music, your ability to name, your risk aversion. All those things can change. So this is how we know that you are your brain, but it turns out it's a very complicated system. So if you just look at the cortex, the outer covering of the brain, you have 10 billion neurons. Neurons are the cells in the brain. They're just like every other cell in your body, except they've got these uh, processes that come off of them that carry signals rapidly. So you have 10 billion of these, and each one of these neurons is about as complicated as a city, and they each have about 10,000 connections to their neighboring neurons. And so what this means is that you have about 100 trillion connections between neurons going on in the brain, and that means if you were to take a little cubic millimeter of neural tissue, you have about as many connections in there as you have stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a very complicated system. And the game in modern neuroscience right now is to try to figure out how does this big ball of wet, gushy biological stuff map on to how you see the world and how you perceive the world? Well, it turns out that's a tricky question because as far as perception goes, you open your eyes and there it is. There's the world with all its colors and shapes and sizes. It turns out that's sort of an editing trick that your brain does though because about a third of your brain is devoted to constructing this illusion of vision. And the reason that's very difficult for us to see that is because we're like fish being asked to describe water. We've never seen anything but that. You've never known anything but your own reality. And so it's very difficult to, to pull out the features of it. And it's only if a bubble came up past you that you would say, hey, there's something funny going on about this stuff we call water. So that's what we as neuroscientists are interested in. We're interested in the bubbles that come up in terms of our reality. So it turns out when you start really looking at it under the, the microscope, you see that reality ain't what you think it is. And so I want to illustrate that. Um, so <clears throat> color, for example, is a construction of the brain. Some of you may know this, but color doesn't actually exist in the outside world. All that you have in the outside world is electromagnetic radiation. And that can be of different wavelengths. And when those wavelengths strike your retina, your brain interprets that as a color. But in fact, the color doesn't exist out there. It only exists in here. Now, why do we have the perceptual experience of color? Well, it's because <clears throat> imagine you were an alien from outer space and you could detect different wavelengths. Well, you might go around and tag everything with the different wavelengths of light and you'd be able to, to gather that sort of data. But that's not actually that useful. If you have an immediate perceptual experience of it, that helps you detect the ripe fruit in the trees from a distance. And so for evolutionary reasons, it's this great trick that we have to tag information with an immediate perceptual experience. But it turns out it's a construction of the brain and it's pretty easy to demonstrate this. So you would all agree that this top surface here is darker than the bottom surface, yeah? Okay, well it turns out it's not. So, so I'd like you to hold up your, your finger and block out the middle portion. Just block out this portion here and what you'll see is that they're exactly the same. If you took a photometer and, and ran it over the top and the bottom, you'd see they're exactly the same. It has to do with this gradient in the middle here. It makes your brain think that the top surface is darker than the bottom one. But what this illustrates is the extent to which the reality that you take for granted may not actually be what's happening out there in the physical world. Um, here, you would agree that the checkerboard square that's called A and the one that's labeled B, those are different colors, right? One's black and one's white. Would you believe me that they're exactly the same color as each other? It turns out that because B is in the shadow of this object here, your brain thinks that they're, that they're quite different because it's making all sorts of assumptions about black and white squares and shadows and so on. But in fact, they're exactly the same. Your brain can be very easily fooled in this way. Um, here, would anybody be willing to bet me five bucks 
that the middle square on the top and the middle square on the front face are exactly the same color. They look very different, and the reason they look very different is because of the assumptions that your brain makes about the surrounding colors and the shadows and the lighting. But in fact, if I mask out everything else, what you'll see is they're identical. It's exactly the same. There's no difference between the colors of the squares, and it just has to do with the assumptions your brain makes when it's trying to put together the best story about what's happening out there in the outside world. And it turns out that even when we're talking about something very basic like the color white, you don't, you don't actually know what the color white is. What happens is your brain takes the brightest thing in the scene and it anchors that. And it says, okay, that's what I'm going to see is white. But if I put something brighter in the scene, then your brain says, oh, actually, that's white. And that, I don't know what I was thinking. And if I put something even whiter, your brain says, okay, never mind, that's white. And the other ones, those are more gray. It turns out that whatever the brightest thing is, your brain will call white. So you don't even know the most basic elements, like what is white. Okay. So all this is to illustrate the point that we accept the reality that's presented to us. You would never think about the colors and the lightness and so on as being anything other than the physical world, whereas in fact, it is a construction of the brain. But we accept that. So for example, here's a picture I took in India, and this is your reality if you're colorblind. And if you're not colorblind, then it looks something more like that. But if you're colorblind, you would accept it and you wouldn't think otherwise. Now it turns out, we now know that 10% of the female population has a fourth type of color photoreceptor. Most of us just have three different types of photoreceptors. Some women have four, and as a result, they see colors that the rest of us don't see. And I can't tell you what those colors are because it would be impossible to describe to you just the way that it would be impossible to describe your colors to a colorblind person. But 10% of the population has that very different experience than we do. Okay, so this all leads to an old philosophical conundrum, which is, how do I know that what I'm seeing on the inside, given that it's construction, is the same as what you're seeing? How do I know that what I call blue, my internal experience is the same as what you call blue? Um, well, it turns out, the answer may be that they're quite different on the inside, and it doesn't matter. As long as our mothers both taught us to call this blue, then we can negotiate in the outside world, and we can interact that way, and it doesn't matter that our internal experiences might be very different. But it turns out that the situation's probably even much worse than that. It turns out that what I call reality and what you call reality might be very different uh, from one another. In fact, my reality might be upside down from yours, and it wouldn't matter as long as we know how to negotiate in the outside world, as long as we know how to interact with each other in the outside world. So I've shown you that you accept the reality presented to you and that different realities are possible. So all this has gotten me thinking over the last few years, so what is reality, really? What is it? Well. The mystery is this, all you actually have going on inside your head is this vast symphony of electrical and chemical signals, right? Those billions of neurons going on in there. If you were to have some kind of fancy camera where you could get inside the head and navigate around like this, all you would see is electrical activity. And the question is, how does that map onto anything when you're listening to a beautiful piece of music? This is all that's happening with that beautiful piece of music. Remember, your, your brain is encased in darkness and silence. It doesn't get to see the outside world. All it ever sees are these electrical signals. So how does that map onto reality? Well, it turns out, it's kind of strange, your brain has to learn how to map that onto reality. It doesn't come for free. You have to interact with the world and figure out what the statistics and the regularities are in the world, and then your brain starts having these perceptual experiences. So I'll tell you what I mean by that. I'll give you an illustration. So on the left here is a gentleman named Mike May, who at the age of three uh, was involved in a, a chemical explosion and um, it, it robbed him of his eyesight. So he spent the rest of his life blind. Um, and he, uh, that didn't stop him from becoming a successful businessman. He also became a successful skier. This is him on the left. And not only just a good skier, he became the world champion blind downhill skier. So here he is going about 40 miles an hour, navigating the terrain by feel and by auditory cues. So he became a fantastic skier. Okay, well here's what happened. At the age of 45, Mike May heard about a new surgical technique that could essentially clean up and, and replace his corneas so that light could get back through so that he could have his vision restored. Because there was nothing wrong with his brain. The problem was that his corneas had gotten uh, damaged by the chemical explosion. So he elected to take that surgery. So here's Mike the day after the surgery 
And here he is with his two sons. Now, this was supposed to be a touching moment. The problem was Mike had no idea what he was looking at. So even though his eyes were working fine now and getting signals to his brain, his brain just saw a barrage of electrical activity, and he couldn't actually be said to be seeing, even though the signals were going through his visual system, because his brain had no idea how to interpret it. So here he is looking at his son's face, and to his brain, it's like a foreign language. There's no, he can't understand it, because his brain has to learn how to take all that electrical activity and make it into a perceptual experience. So for two weeks, Mike walked around looking at this crazy barrage of shapes and edges and colors, and none of it made sense. For example, he had known from his life as a blind man that when you go down a hallway, the walls remain parallel. They stay parallel the whole time. But when you look down a hallway, the lines converge. Well, that doesn't make sense, and his brain had to really work. So what he did is he went around for two weeks and stared at things, and eventually his brain figured out what to do with that incoming data stream. Essentially, you've plugged in eyes to the system now, and the brain eventually figured it out and learned how to see. Well, this got me really interested in, in something, because I thought, well, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. If the brain can take a data cable that's plugged in and figure out how to interpret the signals, then what are the limits of the brain's adaptability? Can you just plug in any kind of signal that has some regular relationship to the outside world and the brain will figure it out? Well, the answer is yes. So here's a technology that's actually been around since the 1970s. This is called the sonic glasses. And this is used with, with blind people. And here's the idea. You take a little camera, you put it on the forehead, and you translate what the camera is seeing into auditory signals that go into the ears. And you translate the camera's video feed into the pitch and the amplitude, and also the difference between the right and left. And so as you walk around, the, the video feed makes noises, so it goes like this. And you're walking around like that, hearing it. Now, at first, it just sounds like a cacophony, right? So blind people walk around, and they hit their shin on the table, and they think this is a lousy device. After two weeks, they're, they're seeing. They're, they're actually having visual experience through the auditory system. Why? Because you're plugging in data from the world through an unusual channel but you're plugging that data in, and their brain, at first, has all the, it's like a language you can't speak, and it figures it out. OK, so all of this got me thinking about, about the adaptability of the brain, and how if you plug any sort of data cable into it, it'll eventually figure it out. And so that made me think about what happens on evolutionary time scales. And so I don't want to get too technical, but I've come up with a model called the MHP model. Um, the MPH model, which is, uh, which is how I think Mother Nature does this in time. And, and it's the following. We're essentially a plug and play system. So all Mother Nature needs to do is invent new peripheral devices and plug them right into the system. And the brain will figure out how to work with it. So Mother Nature comes up with uh, you know, photon capturing devices and uh, air compression devices and um, pressure and temperature sensors and chemical sensors, right? All she needs to do is plug those in, and the brain figures out how to work with it. So it's an ingenious solution, because it means that Mother Nature doesn't need to invent a new brain all the time. All she needs to do is invent new peripherals and plug these right into the CPU. It's an incredible solution. And so then I started looking around at what's going on in nature, and you see this all over the place. So this is an animal called the star-nosed mole. This is its nose you're looking at in the middle of its face. Its nose has 20 little fingers on it. And so this goes around in the dark, and it touches everything with these 20 little fingers. Well, that's a weird peripheral device, right? Who cares? Mother Nature figures it out, plugs it right onto the animal, and the animal figures out how to work with it. Um, of course, with pit vipers, they've got these little heat sensing pits. Well, I'd like some of those. Those are great. You just plug those into the system, and the snake's brain figures out what to do with it. We now know not only birds, but even large mammals like cows have uh, magnetic sensing. They have magnetite, and they, it turns out that cows all over the world align themselves with the magnetic field. And this was just discovered because some people, uh, some scientists, took hundreds and hundreds of Google satellite images and looked at the cows and all these images and realized that they're all lined up with the magnetic field of the Earth. Well, that's great. All Mother Nature needs to do is say, OK, here's the magnetic sense, and then they line up. OK, so the point is, if Mother Nature can, can introduce new peripheral devices like that, might it be the case that we could start coming up with our own peripherals? 
And I think the answer to that is yes, and that's got me thinking about the future of reality with Brain 2.0. And it seems to me that in the future, what we're going to be doing is plugging new data cables directly into the cortex. So the way we'll probably start with this is by extending the little window of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum that you can see. So right now, you only see a little tiny bit of that spectrum, but we could extend it so that you're seeing ultraviolet like honeybees do, or so you're seeing infrared like rattlesnakes do, right? You could start seeing more and more information. But from there, we could do extraordinary things like plug stock market data or weather data directly into the brain, and then you'd end up perceiving that. So I think, for better or worse, this is going to be the, the future. Forget sixth sense, we're talking seventh eighth, and ninth senses here, all these things plug directly into the brain and this is how we'll experience reality. So, so I started by saying that we're like fish in water trying to understand the reality around us, but I think probably our future is that we're going to simulate our own realities and they will be indistinguishable to us. We won't be able to tell the difference. Essentially, we'll be living in virtual reality exactly as we are right now and it may be the case that we're already simulations and our experience wouldn't be any different if we are. Okay, so I hope I've disabused you of the notion that you know what reality is. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to leave you with that. I'll just say I think there's an interesting analogy to our own life here as we think about the reality that we're presented with and that we accept. And I hope that uh, now that you've maybe seen the limits of the fishbowl that you think about ways that you can transcend it. Thank you very much.